The design of any object is absolutely essential. As Richard Sapper, the original conceptual designer of the ThinkPad's iconic look, once said, If the design doesn't respect its function, then it is a mistake. But if a product only has this function of being functional, and it doesn't have some formal expression that makes, that makes, that awakes your interest when you look at it, and that helps in creating a human relation between you and this product, then it's not a good design. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Laptop Retrospective. Today we'll be taking a look at the X300's design, which, for the time, was very revolutionary. If you haven't seen part one, I would encourage you to go back and watch that, just to get some context on what we're about to be diving into. Like many projects before it, once Kodachi got started, there were many competing designs on what the final product would look like. The original design was related to another project that was being explored called Bentofly, also known as Butterfly 2. Richard Sapper and David Hill wanted a computer that didn't look like a computer until it was open. I wanted to make an object that looks like a black cigar box and that shows on the outside nothing of, being, of what it is, except for the logo of the producer. Then when you open it, you see that this is not a cigar box, but it is a computer. And you see all the complicated stuff that's inside. And that would create uh, a surprise. And this is the basic concept of the ThinkPad. This design didn't make it too far because the screens were now large enough to accommodate any size of keyboard that the manufacturer truly wanted. Kodachi had a series of wishlist features that they were hoping to incorporate into the design. The first was no visible ports or stickers before the laptop was open. This was not possible due to technical limitations, as well as some companies like Microsoft insisting their stickers not be hidden. Other regulatory stickers were also non-negotiable either. Wireless charging was briefly explored, but the technology at the time was simply not ready. Lastly, they were hoping to hide the hinges. This proved not to be possible on the X300 due to all the wires running through those hinges. This would, however, be achieved on later models once the technology got better. Some other planned features for Kodachi included a ThinkPad logo with a red LED eye that lit up. Ultimately, this was not added as there was no room in the hinge for the wire, and it would have added an unacceptable 1mm of thickness to the display of the device. Another plan, according to David Hill, was the inclusion of a beautiful metallic badge, but it was cost prohibitive and then scrapped. A ThinkLight with a UV LED that would illuminate special paint on the keyboard for use in the dark was also explored. However, when they got working on the prototypes, the UV light paint didn't appear bright enough. So they stuck with the traditional LED think light. One decision that was made very early on that was considered controversial was actually no inclusion of a dial-up modem. The ThinkPad X300 would be the first ThinkPad to feature an LED backlit screen a solid-state hard drive, or SSD, and it was the only computer to feature the 7mm optical drive made by Panasonic. Panasonic would in fact stop making these drives as it was too complex and expensive. The X300 and 301 were the only computers to use this part. Two styles of laptop were originally planned, a matte finish and a piano black. Glossy paints were tried in 2001, However, the designers were very hesitant about using them again, and ultimately, the Piano Black model was scrapped. David Hill, who worked on the design of the X300, also remembers several other concessions and challenges that they had during the design of the X300. 
oddly enough, most everything that we wanted, we did actually get in. We, we did make two different models early on in the process, one with and one without an optical drive. And that was a big decision. And there were, there were like two camps. One camp was, well, we can make it, you know, a little bit thinner, a little bit lighter if we don't build it in. And the other camp was, come on, we got to build it in because that's just going to prove that we can make this super light, thin thing. And I was really torn because the difference in thickness and, and weight was pretty significant. And I can remember being in the meeting with Peter Hortensius and he looked at me and he said, what would you do, Dave? And I said, well, if I was any other company, any other brand, I'd make it as thin as possible. But this is ThinkPad. We have to pull a rabbit out of a hat. We got to do something that no one can believe because it's easy to throw stuff overboard. I mean, that's, that's what Apple did. They threw everything imaginable overboard, right? And so, you know, for me, that was the greatest, the smartest thing we did was to actually go for the full meal deal. Let's build everything in. That was, that was really, really smart. Uh, in terms of what maybe I didn't get, there were some compromises made like on the, uh, the quality of the nameplate. I wanted a higher quality uh, ThinkPad nameplate. It was always argued um, about you know, the cost of that because it, you know, it's, uh, it's an expensive kind of part or it can be. Um, I wanted a really super high quality one, like a piece of jewelry. But, you know, I think like the one we used on it cost a few cents and the one we wanted was several dollars. And it was just hard to justify it. So oh. it was like, okay. And, you know, in the end, it didn't really matter because people still fell in love with the thing. I also wish it could have had better packaging, uh, a little bit more consumer-friendly packaging. But it really isn't a consumer product. It wasn't intended to be a consumer product. But when you read some of the view, reviews or comparisons, people say, look at the packaging, the Apple thing comes in. Well, okay, it all goes in the dumpster. But, you know, it would have been nice to have had a, you know, like a really slick, cool package um, that, that was still environmentally friendly because that was a thing I was always possessed with. That if we're going to make a cool package, it should be also environmentally friendly, which is possible. In fact, the packaging today is quite environmentally sound. We got most of everything we wanted. It was, it was pretty impressive. Cost wasn't the only consideration to take in. Weight was also a factor. This even came down to the paint. The paint was comparatively expensive at 87 cents a coat and added 40 grams of weight. For this reason, it was removed from around the display and concentrated on areas that the person using the laptop would touch. Speaking of the lid, it was designed to be opened with one hand, and it was successfully achieved. To meet the thinness specifications, a new battery and trackpad had to be designed. They wanted to ensure that there was no bulge from the battery. The Intel Core 2 Duo allowed for the motherboard to be reduced 10% in size, as the room was not needed for components that were integrated into this new CPU. While a mono speaker was originally planned, the designers found room for stereo speakers in the palm rest that were upward firing, not downward. The inclusion of the solid state drive or SSD was one of the biggest challenges the project faced. There was significant reliability and quality control issues with the 64 gigabyte drives that they had chosen to use. Two providers were working on them to make them run reliably. However, it would be Samsung that would provide the drive ultimately shipped with the machine. While the laptop was being designed, Marketing was trying to figure out what kind of demand there would be for such a product. It wanted to sell 130,000 units in 12 months for what they considered to be a niche product. Researched projections said 60,000 units could be sold, which unfortunately was below the target. However, there was confidence that it would do better once people saw and touched the product, since it was doing something that had never really been done before, and they felt the market did not have a frame of reference for such a device. While in many ways this project was an opportunity for the designers to work off-leash, there was the matter of costs that needed to be controlled. 
this was not going to be a cheap product, David Hill remembers some of these conversations during the development of the X300. There was always a lot of discussion about cost. And that was, that was de rigueur in the PC business, no matter what. And here we were trying to make this, you know, the greatest ThinkPad ever. And we couldn't just do anything. You know, we, we had this idea in our heads. We can do anything. You know, this is going to be ThinkPad, you know, Lenovo's first ThinkPad. We've got to demonstrate to the world that, you know, they understand how to do this. But then, you know, you sort of hit, hit with this, you know, slap in the face of reality. Like, whoa, we're a little over budget on this thing. We got to, we got to be smarter. But, you know, we were, we were well versed in that world of how to squeeze pennies out of things. And so there was a lot of very uh, intense negotiation and creativity to solve some of those cost pressures. Because we, you know, if we'd made this thing and the cost didn't matter, we wouldn't have sold any. It would have just been like executive, you know, jewelry. And we wanted this thing to be, uh, to have broad appeal and market success, not just be, you know, some sort of like, um, uh, you know, concept car. So that was, that was always, always a problem that we, we kind of had to wrestle with. But it was part of the, uh, part of the creativity the challenge, you know, do we really need to paint that part? Well, maybe not. Let's try. Or do we need two coats of paint? How much money will that save? You know, this kind of thing. Or the, the nameplate where I wanted the expensive nameplate. You know, we made the right decision. And it hurt a little bit personally because I wanted it to be, you know, this piece of jewelry. But that, that's okay. In the end, it didn't matter. In January of 2008, a month before it was officially announced, 425 prototypes were assembled and distributed within the company. Each took about 10 minutes to assemble and about 25 steps. Somehow they managed to beat their target weight of 1.54 kilograms or approximately 3.4 pounds by creating a machine that was 3.1 pounds or 1.4 kilograms with a 3 cell battery. Thank you so much for watching the second episode of Project Kodachi. Next time we will be taking a look at the X300 on a tabletop video, very traditional laptop retrospective style. If you enjoy this sort of content and would like to see more, I'm going to encourage you to do the big four. Please like the video, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll be notified the next time that an episode of Project Kodachi is released. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.